This is the website, The Way, The Truth, and The Life. The purpose of this video is to give some insights into worldwide Islam, racism, and the involvement of entanglement of these things and the false academic understandings that are uh, causing many errors in public policy. Uh, this is uh, October 23rd and uh, there are three major events in the last two weeks here in Russia that are being used to uh, bring out these points. Uh, it started with a stabbing of a young man walking his girlfriend home in Moscow and being stabbed by a Muslim. And then the following uh, riots over the problems that the Moscovites are having with the Muslims. And then uh, not far from here, uh, last week, a woman suicide bomber blew up a bus killing six people and critically wounding 20 some. So that's uh, the purpose of this and the context that we're using. At the end of the article, I have a Washington article uh, by Daniel Pipes that uh, has uh, some pretty good insight into it. Thank you. I'm in the Russian Caucasus and not too far from here. Yesterday, a young woman, suicide bomber, murdered herself and at least six others as she blew up a bus. We know from the investigators in the, in the city of Volgograd that the blast uh, happened at 2 p.m. local time in a bus, in a public bus, uh, seconds after it left uh, a bus stop, and it had 40 passengers on board. As it stands, uh, six people have been confirmed dead, and also we know that the suicide bomber, a female also um, dead, um, also was killed in this uh, blast. 28 people were delivered to hospitals, and most of them, 27 in fact, are reported to be in severe condition and they have suffered severe wounds and uh, doctors are uh, battling for their lives basically as we speak. In America, Caucasian means white European. Here, Caucasian means a dark person, typically Muslim. My wife grew up in Armenia. There's a Russian there. And went to school with Armenian girls, which tend to be dark. And one of them, in a conversation with my wife, cried. She said, we used to be white. The Armenians, the few that are left after so much murder by Muslims, they were, uh, are dark because they've been raped so much by invasions on one side from Arabs and from uh, the other side by uh, Turkmen, but Muslim invasions from both sides. And every time it involves uh, heavy rape. The historical truth is the majority of the Caucasus were white-skinned people before the Mongol and uh, Turkic uh, Tartar invasions. That, uh, then even with that they were largely Christian areas. Uh, remember Muhammad wasn't born until about 600 years after Christ. So these were Christian areas that were invaded by dark-skinned Muslims after that and forced into Islam. There are examples of where uh, the, the uh, invading Muslim army, the men either converted or they were put on the pile without heads. They were given a choice. The, 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 by and large, the people were forced to convert to Muslim Islam or die. And that's part of the Quran. Read Surah 9. Read about the, They were a little bit kinder to uh, some groups and they were kinder to the Jews. The Jews were the people of the book and the Jews rejected Christ the same as they did. So the Muslims where they were not in conflict with the Jews worked together with them and used them as their administrators like in Spain and Egypt and uh, 
uh, in the Balkan areas. Uh, Turkey rescued many of the uh, Jewish from uh, Spain when it was recovered by the Christians and they remained in Turkey. The problem that the, the uh, Muslims have with uh, the Jewish uh, started from the First World War when uh, England got control of the Holy Land and, and uh, gave uh, right to the Jews to immigrate. And when in 1948 they made uh, Israel a state, the Jewish population in Turkey that had many of them had uh, been there since uh, 1492 or so when the Christians retook uh, Spain. Well, they quickly fled to uh, be part of the new Israel. And this is what turned the Arabs against the Jews. There are many Orthodox Jews that have contempt for Zionism. Zionism is the Israeli state, uh, which was uh, created by uh, the Zionistic view that they needed a state, but supported by England, and England gave them this. So before that, Jews lived throughout the Muslim world safe. And uh, you can uh, see now that the, 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 uh, have this uh, jargon about the uh, Judeo-Christian faith and they've completely gotten the support of the Christian community and I'm not against that. I, I believe Israel has the right to exist. The, uh, the freedom of uh, Christians to go to the Holy Land or to live there if they want to, that's another problem. Be careful. Orthodox Jews have some contempt for that. But um, at any rate, that's a little bit of the background. But there's more to it than just Muslim, non-Muslim, and dark and light, and we'll talk about that. A week ago, a young man in Moscow was uh, walking his girlfriend home, and she was harassed by a um, immigrant from the Caucasus, a Muslim, and when the boyfriend defended her, he was attacked and stabbed in the heart, killed. The news reporting shows so much ignorance, and there's uh, so much ignorance about race, but I have insight into the uh, cause and the, the fallacy academic ignorance going on in sociology, where it comes from. I will explain that first. Second, I have insight into the genetic problems that men have and women have from a history of hunter-gatherer, a couple million years, and even before the violence of uh, uh, men against men and men taking women. And I have very clear insight into the invaders and race connection from my experience that I will share with you. So these three things uh, about race and uh, Islam and uh, the genetic problems that we have. I'll, I'll first go into the one where the academic expert from uh, the European Union has such nonsense and it's paraded as an expert from academia. Protests then turned violent as demonstrators, some chanting nationalist slogans, attacked a shopping centre and broke into the vegetable warehouse. Natalia Marshalkovich speaks with the head of the Migration Policy Institute in Berlin, Olga Gulina. She says murder in the streets of Moscow, whether or not immigrants are involved, are common. But this one triggered such a strong reaction. The protest almost turned into a pitched street battle. Why is that? 
Of course, unfortunately, we're like other countries, such as France, Sweden and Britain, where similar things have happened when it comes to problems with immigrants, and this turned into a riot. Why right now, no one can answer that. One of the important points about academic ignorance of Islam here is that according to the Quran, non-Muslims must pay protection to Muslims. Now they don't have enough people to enforce that directly in America or in Russia or Europe today, but some insight. Uh, Olga's grandfather was good at making and repairing his wagon wheels and as a favor to a Muslim, he uh, took on the job of uh, repairing some wagon wheels for him. And then he went and delivered them. And the uh, Muslim invited him in for tea. And um, Olga's grandfather asked the man while they were drinking tea, why do the Muslims steal from us? There was a Russian village and they had to have guards at night uh, for the stealing of the cattle and horses. And uh, he said, that's because you owe us. It's in our holy book. Well, that same thing uh, went on and goes on all over. That's why to, in, in one sense, to a Muslim to take from you, if you're not paying them this protection money, you owe it to them. So if they take something of yours, that's okay. And to make it a crime, then you're violating Islam somehow, like those uh, terrible policemen in France uh, going after uh, young criminals. But uh, because they're Muslim, that's not criminal. They, you owe them. But the same thing, uh, the protection money for ships to go in the Mediterranean before America was free from England was being paid by England. They paid ransom money to the Muslims to uh, let the ships go. And that was their protection money. During the Revolutionary War, France paid tribute to uh, the American ships would be free. They flew the French flag. But after the war, France stopped and uh, America wasn't paying tribute. They were flying their American flag and the ships were taken. Thomas Jefferson and uh, Ben Franklin w went to Paris to negotiate with the Die of ne Algiers. Uh, that's, this is what caused that we had to build a navy. We were paying up to one sixth of the federal budget to buy back ships and crews from the Muslims. And that's what caused the United States to build a navy. And, uh, the song from the uh, halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli was the recovering uh, the freedom for ships to go on the high sea and not have to pay protection money to Muslims. So that that's just in the background. And then Thomas Jefferson wanted to understand the enemy, so he had a uh, Quran translated into English. And now <laughs> that Quran <laughs> sits in Washington and there's been two Muslims took oath of office on it. And that very book says to kill the non-Muslim if they don't submit and to bring the world under subjection of Islam to a Muslim and according to Islam, their nationality is Islam. Just like that psychiatrist uh, major that killed a bunch of soldiers. He was being loyal to Islam and uh, was proud of it. And they are proud of it. They're at the point where they need to submit. And as you will see, many young women are submitting on their own in Europe and America. That has to do with... Uh, 
attraction to the invader, but there'll be more about that in, uh, shortly. But we were expecting it. For instance, in July, we had the same thing in the city of Pugachev, not far from the saratov Volga region, rioting with a lot of people involved. Now it's come to the capital, Moscow. This is where the academic ignorance starts. I think it will get worse because policies haven't changed and conditions haven't improved. Relations between local populations and immigrants are not at the level they should be. This is where she makes the Russian authorities and the authorities in other countries the guilty ones. With the present case we're dealing with, it's clear that the murder angered the local people against the weakest and least protected part of the country's population. This is mostly not true. The police are afraid. That's why they wear masks. Many police are murdered. Also, there is corruption. These immigrants pay the police so that they can carry on their illegal activities. Week. The migrant workers walk around with knives, threaten people, commit rape close to the police station. They attack and mug people, but nobody shows this. All these facts are kept hidden in police reports, and we look like fools. The killer is yet to be found, but the death of Yegor Shebakov has already sparked a nationalist outcry in his neighborhood and Moscow's worst anti migrant violence in three years. Immigrants. Could this have been avoided? Is this explosion of anger just because of migration policy, or are there other things to factor in? This is where the academic ignorance starts. Uh, the foundation was in the race riots in America, that the books on sociology that address these problems of minorities came from that era. I, when I was 16 in America, I was on the road selling magazines door to door, a different city every week. We had a crew manager and three cars. We would go door to door selling magazines all week and on Sunday we'd pack up and move to the next city. You can read about this in door to door magazine crews if you Google it on the internet. I started off in the poor areas and that was many black and some white. The blacks generally had nice apartments. The whites that lived in the and the uh, poverty areas lived in garbage. They were called white trash. I was in one home where the kitchen table was so dirty the only clean spot was where a plate scratched it when it was set on the table. But <clears throat> in the, the uh, 50s there was a, a policy of welfare in the northern states and um, blacks were immigrating from the south. But when I was on the road in the 50s, there were still many black areas of the men, the fathers were there, the homes were well taken care of, and the men dressed uh, very respectfully. It was, and it were, they were safe neighborhoods to walk through. But the welfare had started and the welfare was given to women who didn't have a husband. And the amount of welfare depended on the amount of dependent children. And it just grew into a, a real problem. And uh, that is children without a father. And uh, the bad behaviors on the streets began to grow. It had already grown to uh, some of the apartments uh, that were, uh, you, you couldn't stand the smell in the elevator from the pee and in the back hallways poop and, and the garbage thrown out the windows. That was in the uh, high-rise apartment buildings for, uh, for everybody. But this, this problem of a breakdown of the black home, no, no meaningful uh, father or husband, uh, and the children being given daycare, 
or no care. Um, so things were broken down. This fatherless home building went on for the next 10 or 12 years and my life was interesting during that time. I turned 17 and even though I hadn't been to high school, the Air Force uh, said I passed the test so high they sent me to radio school. And I had gotten out of there, worked construction and went to the steel mill once I got married, was an electrician there and uh, had gone from Bethlehem Steel in Buffalo to uh, Lake Erie Rolling Mill in uh, Tonawanda, New York, as uh, in charge of uh, maintenance of a, a rod mill there. That's a background for what comes next. And what the sociologists recommended and, uh, with all these uh, race riots then, and uh, Martin, and along this time, uh, and, and Martin Luther King, to and he was killed by a, a, a hateful person. So there was no strong voice, but uh, he was no longer there to um, try and, and bring some sanity to these young black men that had no father. Well, so it was such a wonderful thing that South Africa had uh, Desmond Tutu and. Uh, Nelson Mandela, wonderful black man that got out of prison and was president there right now. But what a blessing that he was there to help guide young men. Although you can still see the hatred for whites there and that's a whole other thing. At any rate, the sociologists advised the government and business community to hire these young blacks and give them a job. As I said, I was supervisor of maintenance in a plant and we had to hire this young black 17 year old or 18 year old and um, as it turned out we, we couldn't fire him and he had a radio he'd sit around listening to his radio but yeah, surprisingly after a month he began to take hold and he was answering calls responsibly and, and i was just pleased to see how that worked out at any rate that's the way they stop the race riots as a, a, an affirmative action policy. Whether they were qualified or not, you had to hire them. Whether they were qualified or not, you had to let them in. Uh, to, in in uh, later years uh, uh, of the um, 60s, I was at Carborundum Research and this affirmative action became so strong, they couldn't get a contract without hiring women and blacks whether they were qualified or not and the universities had to take them whether they were qualified or not and that still exists this affirmative action it they had to hire so many unqualified people they no longer could afford to pay men enough to support a family because they had to spread it around and then uh, carver unamended we were working in nuclear ceramics but uh they ended up losing uh their uh, competitiveness and uh, the uh, contracts went to places like Germany and Japan because they had to hire so many people that were not productive. At, uh, at any rate, that's where this thought came from that it, it takes 10 or 15 years in advance to solve the problem. You have to give them a job and give them a uh, uh, and keep them off the streets. Well, it had nothing to do with Islam. It had to do with uh, fatherless homes and, and hoodlums out on the street rioting and give them a job to get them off the street. Muslims have the fathers in the homes, but they have to memorize the Quran and they are taught that the, the unbeliever is not respected and as a matter of fact when they have control they first put need to put fear in the unbeliever and if they don't convert surah number nine makes it very clear cut off their hands and cut off their heads if they don't submit and that's the truth it has nothing to do with fatherless homes and, and the the groping 
uh, I've had with my wife here on the street, I've had to put up with it. It has nothing to do with that these men weren't raised without a father. It has to do with they view the, the non-Muslim women as a sex object, even if she's walking with a white man. And they're not afraid. Look what this man says. We haven't caused any scandal. It was all set up. They shout and scream, telling us to leave. Do you think that would change anything? It wouldn't change. It would only be worse. Pay attention to international news. Every day there's four, five, six cases of mass murder on, in the name of Islam, what he's saying is we're coming. We've reached that stage. We're openly. We're not trying to hide our violence. It's meant to show you you need to be afraid. And these foolish Russians don't understand. And they're just going to make it worse for themselves. It might have been avoidable, but every action in migration policy has to be taken 10 to 15 years in advance. That's to say that what we do today, we're only going to see the effect of in 5 or 10 years' time. We're seeing today in Russia the results of actions taken 10 or 15 years in the past. To avoid the October 10th rising in Moscow would have meant thinking ahead. We have to think about what to do now to lessen the risks of similar events happening in future. What has to be done? Can we draw on other countries' positive experiences? Of course there are some. There's advice given in 1968 by a well-known American sociologist. There it was, the 1968 sociologist model in academia that came out of the American experience. It has nothing to do with Islam. There's advice given in 1968 by a well-known American sociologist who proposed four models of cooperation between local and immigrant populations. The four concepts are integration, assimilation, segregation, and marginalization. The results will depend directly on which model Russia, I think, is repeating the same mistakes France made when it chose a policy of marginalization, one by which the already established population and the immigrant population live completely separately from each other. This woman is showing her ignorance. The Quran specifically says that it's for Islam, it's uh, in the Quran, it's perfectly acceptable to deceive the unbeliever. But the Quran also says it is not to take the unbeliever as a friend. While I was in the Air Force, I took five two hour tests at the base education office and got my high school diploma. Then I took uh, four two hour tests and got uh, two years uh, college equivalency. So I was uh, then took a leave of absence from carborundum research there in the late uh, 60s. I had gone from Lake Erie Rolling Mills to the carborundum research and was working on nuclear ceramics with boron carbide in, embedded in an AL203 matrix. But I was on leave of absence at the university for degrees in mathematics and physics. And uh, there were a number of Muslim students there from Iran that uh, were studying and they used to come to get help with the uh, math problems there in the science and engineering library at the University of Buffalo, State University of New York. And uh, I ended up with friends with some of them. They weren't all that nice, and there was a group of them when they had a research project. They'd taken, uh, gather up all the books that were referenced in the project and hide them someplace and share them amongst the fellow Muslims. But uh, we managed to deal with those things. And I, uh, one fellow, I ended up quite uh, friendly with, and um, I invited. I was married, had three kids at the time. I invited him and his wife to come for supper. And he looked at me and he says, uh, we're Muslim, you know. 
And I asked him, what does that mean? He says, well, um, what do Muslims do? He says, well, we uh, pray five times a day. And he said, well, I pray. And morning when I get up, I pray at the three meals, and I pray at supper when I go to bed. What's the big difference? Uh, come on over. Tell him. He, uh, he was hesitant, but to him and his wife did come. For a meal and and he was very uncomfortable uh, I asked to be invited to his home and there were more than one couple living in that home what I didn't understand at the time is that the Quran says Muslims are not to make friends with non-Muslims now here's a Muslim preacher near ground zero in New York uh, reaffirming the Quran to the Muslims, they try and shape them up. This revival, ya Muslimin, requires that you rise up, that you make dua for the Mujahideen, that you defend them when they're assaulted by the hypocrites, by the pacifists, by the moderates, and by the enemies of Islam. We tell you Muslims to rise up and make a wala. Make allegiance to Allah and His Messenger. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, O oh, you who believe, do not take my enemies and your enemies as friends. Showing affection towards them. While they have disbelieved in the truth that has come to you, do not take my enemies and your enemies as awliya. You want Barack Obama to save your condition. You don't mind if Afghani civilians are bombed every day. As long as it's not your house. As long as it's not your daughter. As long as it's not your children. You are content to stay silent. That's it. From us, the proof of the Muslimin is that those that remain content and silent living amongst the Kufar, while the Kufar are at war with the Muslims, is that they have apostated. They have become Martadin. They have left the religion of Islam because Allah says repeatedly, you must not take as awliya those Jews and Christians, those disbelievers, those enemies of Islam, that they are friends to one another. So Barack Obama who called for Jerusalem to belong solely to the Jews and who allies with Israel against the Muslims is not your friend, ya Muslimi. He will do nothing to rescue you from your punishment, ya Muslimi. Jihad, peace of Allah will rescue you from your punishment, ya Muslimi. And supporting of the Mujahideen will rescue from your punishment, ya Muslimi. So that we can establish Islam in the earth. So that we can implement the hudud. So that we can implement the Sharia and say to hell with democracy, to hell with America, to hell with nationalism, to hell with Barack Obama, and then bless God Jesus Christ worshiping buffoonery. To hell with every ideology, ism, and schism that does not agree with that Islam. This is Islam. This is Islam. And anyone that tells you otherwise does not understand their deeds. She just doesn't understand the 2005 riots in France were part of Islam. It wasn't just France. There were cars burned all over Europe and Russia. Here in our little city in Russia, in southern Russia, there were cars burned in sympathy. It's on purpose to put fear in the non-Muslims. The police were willing to go and enforce the law and chase the criminals вільно друг от друга мігранти включають immigrants contribute to the country's wealth but are left out of the country's social life i'm sorry but this woman is talking like a fool the prime example muslim countries in the head of islam saudi arabia it's against the law for non-muslims to enter the two largest cities Mecca and Medina. The death penalty is within the choices of punishment. Muslims, it's against the law to carry a Bible. They raid homes if they think that people are studying Bible there. They do not want to integrate with non-Muslims anywhere. 
another example is Germany, which has an absolutely different policy. It's trying to organize deep assimilation of immigrants into the local population. In Germany, in many cities, my German friend says the police won't even go into Muslim areas anymore. And that includes the honor killing of young women, Muslim women, for getting involved with non-Muslim boyfriends. Обеспечить как можно более тесное, глубокое проникновение местного и пришлого населения. Большое спасибо, Ольга. What is the matter with her? Here in the uh, uh, North Caucasus, the there um, the non-muslims are immigrating because it's not safe they've already uh, look at the look at the uh, a number of non-muslims that have moved out of of uh, Dagestan Chechnya and so forth and Chechnya they let the Chechens come back uh, 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 Stalin, uh, when they were supporting Hitler, the Muslims helped Hitler. They worked together. Some of the strongest, uh, the largest murdering Waffen SS group was a Muslim group. Uh, uh, that's a whole other thing. The Chechens, because they were supporting Hitler and killing Jews, they were. Uh, uh, Stalin didn't kill them like he did ethnic Russians, the, the, the Chechens, he moved them uh, to Siberia and after the breakup of the Soviet Union they let him come back. But like a Chechen woman said, my grandfather killed Russians, my father killed Russians, and my husband killed Russians and I'm raising children to kill Russians. And with their birthing policy, as the Turkish general said, we don't have to uh, fight jihad in Europe. We're going to ride the democratic bus. They have a birthing policy, just like in Gaza. They've increased their population five times since 1948. I have nothing against the Muslim, but Islam is a theocratic murdering cult. If you read the Quran, that's what these young children are taught to memorize. That's why they'll put on a suicide belt and go kill themselves and other people in, in a school or a restaurant or anything, and their mother will get elected to the Palestinian legislature for sending three of her sons off to murder children in restaurants and schools. But The violence came even though the murdered man's girlfriend had reportedly opposed the protests, saying she didn't want inter-ethnic conflict to be inflamed. This brings up the next point, that the women are attracted to the invader. In a published article quoting the girlfriend, the girlfriend said the immigrant assaulted her boyfriend after trying to harass her. Across the city, police have been put on alert. Russian investigators have detained a suspect in the murder of a Russian man that set off race riots in Moscow last weekend. Investigators said a 30-year-old suspect named Orkan Zinala, a native of Azerbaijan, had been detained in a town outside Moscow. A police spokesman said Zinala confessed to the crime in an informal conversation with officers escorting him to Moscow. Police did not say what evidence pointed to his involvement in Saturday's stabbing. Zinalov was presented to Vladimir Kolokoltsev, the Russian Minister of Internal Affairs. Moscow police, meanwhile, detained 276 people who were protesting against Saturday's stabbing, which raised tensions between ethnically Russian people and natives of the predominantly Muslim Caucasus region of Russia, many of whom have migrated to major Russian cities for work. There's an interesting TED video on the history of violence and the uh, reality of the hunter-gatherer where up to 60 percent of the men died by violence. Images like this from the Auschwitz concentration camp have uh, been seared into our consciousness during the 20th century and have given us a new understanding of who we are, where we've come from, and the times we live in. During the 20th century, uh, we witnessed the atrocities of Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, Rwanda, uh, and other genocides. And even though the 21st century is only seven years old, we have already witnessed a, an ongoing genocide in Darfur and the daily horrors of Iraq. 
This has led to a common understanding of our situation, namely that modernity has brought us terrible violence and perhaps that native peoples lived in a state of harmony that we have departed from uh, to our peril. Uh, here's an example from a, an op-ed on Thanksgiving in the Boston Globe a couple of years ago where the writer wrote, uh, the Indian life was a difficult one, but there was no employment problems, community harmony was strong, substance abuse unknown, crime nearly non-existent, what warfare there was between tribes was largely ritualistic and seldom resulted in indiscriminate or wholesale slaughter. Now you're all familiar with this uh, uh, treacle, we uh, teach it to our children, uh, we hear it on uh, television and in storybooks. Now, the original title of this session was Everything You Know is Wrong, and I'm going to present evidence that this particular part of our common understanding is wrong. That in fact, our ancestors were far more violent than we are, that violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and that today we are probably living in the most peaceful time in our species' existence. I need to jump in here talking about Native Americans. I grew up in a farm town just outside the Tuscarora Indian Reservation, eight miles from Niagara Falls. And I, my lifelong education was how the poor Indians were treated by the Americans. When I went to look into it, the Tuscarora tribe was part of the Iroquois. The original tribe in the area was the neuter tribe, the, the myth of the uh, Maid of the Mist, where they would sacrifice one of their maidens every year to the god of the falls. Uh, that wasn't the Tuscaroras, that was the neuter Indians. They were neutral, they uh, were accepted in between the Hurons and the Iroquois. The Iroquois were savages that often ate those that they killed. When I looked into it, along with the uh, fur trappers, uh, the, the French, who were coming through the area of the Great Lakes and buying furs from trading furs with the American Indians. And a couple of French priests came along and uh, were preaching Christ to the Indians, the same as it says in Luke chapter 17, go and take nothing for your journey. And the Hurons were converting to Christianity. They gave a place for the priests to stay, and they were preaching to the Hurons. And the Iroquois uh, had a, a fear of them going away from their gods. And the Iroquois went and grabbed these two priests, tied them to posts, and, um, well, one kept preaching Jesus. They cut off his lips and cut out his tongue. They built a fire and they cut the meat off their legs and roasted it in the fire while they bled to death. That was the Iroquois. And then the Iroquois went on to massacre the neuter Indians. The Tuscarora tribe was not the original Indian inhabitants. It was these uh, cannibals who had killed the neuters. I forgot to say the cannibal Iroquois ate the priest's leg meat in front of them. These all of the Native American people, and then of course there's research now that shows that Europeans were uh, there hunting woolly mammoths long before the the uh, Asian population ever got there. But back to the story that violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and that today we are probably living in the most peaceful time in our species' existence. Now, in the decade of Darfur and Iraq, a statement like that might seem somewhere between hallucinatory and uh, obscene, but I'm going to try to convince you that uh, that, that is the, the uh, correct uh, picture. The decline of violence is a fractal phenomenon. You can see it over millennia, over centuries, over decades, and over years. Although there seems to have been a tipping point at the onset of the Age of Reason in the 16th century. One sees it all over the world, although not homogeneously. Uh, it's especially evident in the West, beginning with England and Holland uh, around the time of the Enlightenment. Let me um, take you on a journey from uh, several powers of 10 from the millennium scale to the year scale to try to persuade you of this. 
Until 10,000 years ago, all humans lived as hunter-gatherers without permanent settlements or uh, government. And this is the state that's commonly thought to be one of uh, primordial harmony. But the archaeologist um, Lawrence Keeley, looking at uh, casualty rates among contemporary hunter-gatherers, uh, namely, which is our best source of evidence about this way of life, has shown a rather different conclusion. Here is a graph that he uh, uh, put together showing the percentage of male deaths due to warfare in a number of foraging or hunting and gathering societies. The red bars correspond to the uh, likelihood that a man will die at the hands of another man as opposed to passing away of natural causes in a variety of foraging societies in the New Guinea highlands and the Amazon rainforest. And they range from a rate of almost a 60% chance that a man will die at the hands of another man to, in the case of the Gabuski, only a 15% uh, chance. The tiny little blue bar in the lower left-hand corner plots the corresponding statistic from the United States and Europe in the 20th century, and it includes all the deaths of both world wars. If the death rate in tribal warfare uh, had prevailed during the 20th century, there would have been 2 billion deaths rather than 100 million. This brings us to the point of looking at our background, the genetic makeup, what whether we can be traced back, go to a single tribe when we emerged from the woods onto the savanna and that uh, survival was not easy and inbreeding caused degeneration so they needed to have strange blood but why are humans so much different than the great apes that they were uh, brothers and sisters with three million years ago the great apes breastfeed their babies to like five years old and they don't murder them but uh, why uh, here in Russia, abortion in many years is more than live births for the ethnic Russians. And the same in Europe and the same in America. The amount of, and, and Obama's taking our tax money to pay uh, for abortion. And, uh, but that's another thing. Like Paul said, in God we live and move and have our being. One of God's fundamental laws of what? makes the future is what propagates and what propagates is what survives. Well, what survived over these millions of years that made us different than the great apes? Why would there be uh, the ability to kill infants so easily? The answer really isn't that hard. There are two big genetic effects. First of all, what survived were the groups that the men would attack another tribe and get their young women. That would bring the new blood into the tribe. What survived among the men were the ones that could work together, plan the attack, plan hunting. And they developed a hemispheric specialization, about two billion more brain cells, and the uh, right hemisphere specialized in logic for all this planning they had to do. But the women's brain, both sides were the same. They could suffer a stroke in one side and still have the ability to walk and talk it, uh, and, and go about the daily care that would lead to the survival of their children. So these things tended to survive. The men that would go and get the women, often by violence and rape, so the women that survived, that to propagate, often it was by violence and rape. Uh, um, the same thing is true amongst many of the great apes and other animals. You hear the poor dogs and cats outside the apartment here as the poor females are being chased and cats climbing a tree to get away from all these violent males. And, and But what makes the difference between female great apes who don't kill their babies and their and the humans. One simple thing. There is a two things going on in the female brain genetically tendency. One is 
love, care for the infant, those infants that are cared for are the ones who survive. And a hatred, a hate for the rape, the violence that was done to them. There's much inbred resentment, but there's also the go along with the invader because that's what survived. Young females are attracted to the invader. I'll, I'll bring that up more. But the other side of the picture is the men who would engage in violent attack and the men who could work together with other men as a team were survival characteristics. So on one side you have the women who were attracted to the invader even though they hated the violence and the, what made it so they would kill their babies. It is projecting that hate part. They love their babies, but there's another part that hates. We're not a single entity. We're a number of different life stages and different parts. One part loves a baby, another part hates and resents it. And what builds these and what modifies them has to do with the home care and uh, the breastfeeding and so forth. But why? Why would the women murder their babies? That was the reason for uh, Abraham was the role type. What separated the Jewish from the other peoples is they didn't do child sacrifice. But, um, and Abraham was the archetype for that. That made them a sanctified people, separated from the others. Uh, that even gave them the rationale to kill whole tribes that were attacking them, killing their babies and cannibals to make it a safe place for their children. And Muhammad learned this, uh, that Joshua had murdered whole tribes who uh, were a threat to them. And he used that to build a pyramid scheme of had to serve him. But that's a, a whole nother thing. Muhammad had a job as a commercial caravan leader and camel driver. And many of the customers were Jewish. And in long treks over the desert, he learned about the uh, stories of the Jewish Bible. So what makes that women are different, female humans are different than grade eight females? One simple thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The snake is that violent man attacking and raping her. And the development of logical speech that and the great ape does not associate the child with the rape. They don't have the speech and the ability to see cause-effect relationships. They got raped, that was a long time ago. Then they get pregnant and in, a, in nine months they have a baby. So it, it, they're not connected. Females connected logically. That was your father, the rapist. And you are a product of that violence. You're part of the violence. You can kill the baby. My wife grew up in Armenia where there is big discrimination against Russians. Uh, although they welcome the Russians, they'll even uh, the young men can serve in the Russian army rather than the Armenian army because the Russians have protected the Armenians against the Muslims. So, uh, but they, it's not very safe for a Russian woman to walk alone on the street and even with a man. An, a Russian man can be murdered and it's not seriously investigated. And Olga's uh, had some personal experiences with uh, people getting murdered and hard to even get it investigated and never solved. It's a, they were raped the woman and killed the man that was with her. But that, that's another uh, distraction at this point. I'm going to show you a couple of videos on discrimination in Moscow and I'll explain it. I basically wanted to talk about uh, racism being kind of natural. Because yesterday I went out with people, you know, it was awesome. It was four colored or black people, you can say, in Russia. But there was four black people and there were like three other white people, three Russian people. So it was like there was more black people than like the white Russian people for the first time ever and so there was four of us me two guys who look like my bodyguards 
and a girl who she's amazing, she's really cool, she's funny, so we're going to be hanging out a lot. And I had a lot of fun, so of course we started talking about being black in Moscow. How are we not going to talk about it? Four of us are together, so we're going to talk about it. And like, one thing I learned, and I was so shocked to learn, and I was just shocked as hell because this girl, I don't want to give her name, but this girl was really, really pretty. Like, extremely gorgeous. Like, Halle Berry, and, you know, she she's in good shape and everything. She keeps her hair nice. She smells good. Like, everything about her was good. Like, really good. So, before we started talking about racism, I thought she got it not as bad as me and the other guys because she's good looking. So, I basically thought because she's pretty, guys were nicer to her. Russian guys were nicer to her. She didn't go through what we went through. That's what I thought. Then it just turns out I was extremely wrong. She goes through the same exact things as we do, even from men. And I was so shocked. And I, I was so shocked. I had no idea. So that kind of changes the way I think about things now when it comes to racism. Because I always thought racism was mostly to the men. What I do with fire? All right, there's a guy outside with fire. If something funny happens, I'm going to point the camera over there. But anyway. I thought it was mostly from men to men. You know, that's where I thought most of the powerful racism came from, was from men to men, but apparently it can also be from men to women, to women. Now, like, I don't know, I'm not racist. I don't, I mean, I'm not gonna say racist. I wanna say I don't treat people bad because of their race. Now, for example, let's say we're in New York City. There's a black lady old black lady like 80 years old and there's an old white lady like 80 years old and they both wanted a seat and I can only offer one of them the seat. I would offer the black lady the seat. And it's not because I don't want the white lady to sit down. It's just, uh, you know, I'm more comfortable with black people and, you know, she probably reminds me of a family member and that's just what I'm more used to. So I would feel more guilty if she wasn't sitting down. So I would offer her a seat. But the thing is with like hate, like racism when it's like a hate thing is Using the same example, <laughs> you want there's a black lady who wants to sit down, and there's <clears throat> a white lady who wants to sit down. Now, if I was to let the black lady sit down, then tell the white lady to get off the bus because she shouldn't be there. That's the problem. So, if you necessarily treat your people a little better than other people because you are more used to it and more comfortable with it, that's fine. But the problem really lies in disrespecting other people because they're different. That is the problem with people and their racism. Because this word racism, the, the, the definition is so broad, how it's in a dictionary, and also how people use it. Some people prefer to use prejudice, and they say you can't be racist if you don't have power. So whatever, I'm just trying to make it simple as possible. What's missing here has nothing to do with race. The Quran teaches hatred, even to murder those who reject Muhammad and Islam. It uh, often appears along racial lines, but in fact, <laughs> the white Muslims and black Muslims and sit in the same mosque, no problem, and live together, no problem. It looks like that because the uh, Muslim have uh, taken over uh, darker people. And uh, that, so it's associated with race. But here in Russia, many of the Muslims, are, <laughs> you look at, they're not black or dark. Because eyewitnesses and survivors of uh, this blast confirmed that a suicide bomber detonated the explosive on uh, board the bus just as it left uh, the bus stop um, in almost the central part of uh, the city of uh, Volgograd. And um, yeah, I was basically so shocked, so um, I don't know. I don't really know what to say. I just want, oh, I know what I want to ask. I want to ask, have any of you Russian people, not, I don't want to know any colored people's opinion on this one. What I want to know from the white Russian people is, and be honest, what is the most racist thing you've ever seen done to a black person or a Caucasian, whatever, to any kind of colored person in Russia. What is the most racist thing you ever son you ever saw did or someone did something or said something to them, the most racist thing? And for black people, tell me the most racist thing that happened to you. Like that. That's how we do it. Cause I, I'm still in kind of shock about um 
um, the, the girl going through so many things. Ever since she was a kid, too. So, like, oh, my God. It's crazy out here, nigga. It's crazy for a nigga. For a nigga. Stop my name out. Nigga. Nigga. Gotta make that song one day. And that's really it. I have a headache. I was drinking way too much. Some Russian guy started hanging out with me last night. And every time I turned around, we were having vodka. Jesus. Bleach you keep. All right. I'm out. Later. Now we look at the other side of the coin, that women are attracted to the invader. A little bit more about what I think about Moscow. Uh, one thing I want to mention are the, uh, the girls in Moscow, something I'm noticing. Um, I guess they don't see many black people here, and, uh, or they don't see many black people in real life in general. But what's funny is, like, uh, usually the girls here who like black people or black men are really into black men. So it's like, they will talk to you, and then you'll figure it out in a way in which they don't tell you, you just have to pay attention. So they'll say something like, yeah, you know, I've been to Africa, and it was fun, a lot of fun. And then I'm like, hmm. <laughs> so then I'm like, it was fun. And she's like, yes. And it's like, did you happen to meet any black guys? And she'll be like, oh yeah, a lot. And then I know what she meant. Or you could look at her cell phone and you'll see a black guy with his shirt off or something. And he's like sweating. He just, oh, oh, you know, all that stuff. So it's very interesting how a lot of girls here are into black guys, but they don't get to see many of us. And uh, that's one thing. Again, this is something that I had realized that uh, young women are attracted to the invader. It has nothing to do with race. In the town that I grew up in, the girls were attracted to the Indians on the reservation, or they were attracted to the GIs on the missile base. Uh, they weren't attracted to their own community men. What happened in America that gave me the insight was uh, Johnson had um, boosted integration is setting up uh, subsidized rental apartments and, uh, in the suburbs to move the blacks out and uh, the busing of blacks into the suburban schools. Johnson had uh, instituted a, a, a great society and uh, subsidized rent. I was teaching physics. I taught physics for 22 years at Sweet Home High School, a suburb of Buffalo, New York during this period and they uh, rent, uh, built some subsidized rental apartments in the area to move inner city blacks out. And we had them uh, in our school, Sweet Home High School. And uh, I was surprised, uh, I didn't understand that there was a problem. Of course, I did not, uh, I actually had no students qualify for physics from this inner city group but uh, they would have had to take any other mathematics and chemistry and biology and all those to get to it. And um, that just wasn't happening. But we had a faculty meeting and um, Michael Lepardi, the assistant principal, addressed the faculty meeting and said, we have a problem. This is with the black students that had come in our school district. And uh, he said, we have a dance. The black boys like the white girls and the white girls like the black boys. But, uh, nobody invites the black girls. So we have a, a dance and the black girls come on their own and then nobody dances with them. And it's a real problem uh, socially. For, uh, we need to try and help with this. And we did. We talked uh, to some of the white students uh, that we had and, and the, the teachers themselves set an example by inviting the girls to dance and tried to get, that, um, get them integrated. But uh, it wasn't a race issue. It had to do 
with attraction to the invader. The white boys were not in, attracted to the invaders, and the white girls were. And this, you could ask any any military man, whatever country he went to, the young girls are attracted to them. They have no trouble in getting dates. Whether it's a, an American going to Japan or a J Japanese going to China or wherever. Uh, that, that is just the nature of, because genetically, what had babies? The women that went along to get along, that made themselves pretty and attractive to the invader and went along with that. So there's something there that's real. The rioters and some other locals believe someone from the Caucasus region is to blame for the fatal stabbing of an ethnic Russian man last Earlier, residents had gathered following the murder of Igor Sherbakov. The 25-year-old was stabbed after a dispute over his girlfriend as the couple headed home last Thursday night. Despite a photo of the suspect taken by a security camera, he hasn't been identified. And uh, that's basically it for today. So. I want you to, you know, keep an eye on my new blog channel. I want you to watch what I'm up to in Moscow. Uh, and I will be in St. Petersburg, you know, on the 20th to do the master class. It's going to be a big master class. And it should be fun. And uh, that's basically it. I wish I had more to say, but I'm ready to go and have fun in Moscow, you know. I don't want to die. After a young Russian man was fatally knifed. This was allegedly by a Muslim migrant from the Caucasus region. Police said they arrested around 400 people as part of a criminal investigation into hooliganism. Russia for Russians is an increasingly common outburst by protesters. They demand that darker skinned people be kicked out. Notice that time and time again, the European commentators and the uh, political authority figures don't mention Muslim with these uh, difficult issues. It's immigrants. The police say that limited conflict is quickly seized on by provocateurs with anti-migrant ideals. More than one million people from Central Asian republics of the former Soviet Union or from the Russian Caucasus live in Moscow, around one third of them outside official channels. They don't recognize to the public the truth that this is a Islamic affair and they are becoming the majority and they're starting to take power openly. The threat, the violence is not hidden on purpose. They largely control produce markets and impose their own order, which can extend into organized crime. The media this year reported the police attributed half the crimes in Moscow to residents from other regions. President Putin himself blames problems on foreigners. It's the point of bringing fear to the non-Muslims. And it's working. In America, they're the invader. And the women are attracted. And in Europe, they are the invader. And the women are attracted to them. Their conversion of women to Islam is real. Hello and welcome to Women's World, the only TV show where women's issues are put first every time. If it's in the news and it matters to you, then we're bound to be talking about it here. My name is Yvonne Ridley. And my name is Nabila Zahir. The Muslim faith is under the spotlight again, and this time its detractors and critics are wondering why more women in the West are embracing Islam than any other religion. Yes, in their eyes, Islam is supposed to be a religion which oppresses and subjugates women. Or well, that's what the critics want everyone else to think. And the profile of the new converts has them baffled. According to figures from a multi-faith group called Faith Matters, those most likely com to convert to Islam are career women in their 20s and 30s. The number who've converted has now passed the 100,000 mark with 5,200 recorded last year alone. In the West, Islam is often represented in the West as being oppressive to women. Issues like the hijab have always been contentious. So then why are so many women converting to Islam? With a little insight, this is a no-brainer. The women are attracted uh, to the invader. That's the major reason that Western women are converting to Islam. Now, it's a different story in the prisons. The men turn to Islam the, in the prisons because it gives them a license to vent their hate. 
that's a whole nother story. But two different motivations for joining Islam. One, attraction to the invader, and two, the license to be the invader. Now here's some of the direct teachings from the Quran on treatment of women. ولا بد أن نعلم أن الضربة عقوبة شرعية لا يملك إنسان أن ينكره لأن الذي شرعه هو الذي خلق هذا الإنسان ولأنك يا عبد الله إذا اشتريت جهاز أو سيارة تعطى دليل كتالوج يبين لك طريقة الاستخدام فالذي خلق الإنسان هو الذي أنزل هذا الكتاب ليبين الإنسان الخطى والطريق الذي ينبغي أن يسلكه ولن نستحي أمامهم من الأرض في أيام جهلها أن نقر أن هذا من شريعته وأن نذكر الغافلين الجهلة من أبناء أمة الذين ساروا في ركاب القوم أن القوم اليوم يعترفون بهذا الإعجاز في هذه الآية بالإعجاز في هذه الآية فإن من النساء أصناف ثلاث لا يمكن أن تستقيم الحياة معها إلا بالضرب واضربوهم في هذه لا يعجاز أن أصناف ثلاثة من النساء لا يمكن أن يعيش معها رجل إلا والعصا على عاتقه المرأة الأولى فتاة الرب يدعى لها يطلب منها أن تذهب للمدرسة فسمتنع يضربوها كلي لا أريد يضربوها هكذا اعتادت على الضرب تربت على هذا فنسأل الله أن يعين زوجها عليها بعد ذلك ولن يستقيم معها إلا إذا كان ضرابا للنساء والمرأة الثانية امرأة متعالية مترفع على زوجها لا تحسب له حساب هذه أيضا لا تستقيم إلا بالعصر والمرأة الثالثة امرأة فيها انحراف لا تقتنع بقوة رجلها إلا إذا قهر وإلا إذا ضربه وإلا إذا انتصر عليها عضليا وهزمها بصوته one of the countries under the spotlight for so-called honor crimes is Jordan where the practice is sanctioned by law under the criminal code relatives who kill a woman suspected of shameful behavior receive a light sentence or escape punishment altogether Meanwhile, in Turkey, the law has been changed. Provocation is no longer a defense, and the government has introduced life sentences for such crimes. However, these killings are still supported in some parts of the country. It's estimated at least 60 women are killed in Turkey in this way every year. These things about Islam are not abstract to me. I was in Russia in 2000, and... Uh, we signed up to be married in Moscow. There was a month wait. And during that month, they blew up the Russian subway, murdered a whole bunch of people. That was a wake-up call. What I didn't understand at the time, this was not a clandestine, hidden crime. It was an open crime, and it had a message. It was historic Islam saying, we're here. And this is to teach you a lesson. Submit or else the next one may be you. And they continually in this area in the Caucasus are killing policemen, blowing up things, blowing up buses. About 12 miles from here, blew up a train and killed, I think it was 21 students. Uh, they ride the trail in the, to get to Petrogorsk for the uh, university daily. Uh, just no end. Uh, in, uh, two years ago, they were going to blow up, a, a celebrate Easter by blowing up a church uh, where we fly into Minaron the body here. And that they had had terrorists uh, here, uh, took airplanes and for a ransom. Uh, they, uh, uh, three years ago, they uh, blew up Domodedovo, the airport that we fly into in Moscow, killing about 60 people. The women with bombs in their burkas blew up two of 
airplanes on the airlines that we fly south from Moscow on. No, no end. I keep track of um, Islam uh, since 2007 when I learned of the three young men being brutally tortured and murdered by Islamists in Turkey and actually Erdogan has covered it and uh, put on trial the men that would have protected them and, and uh, blamed Virus them Database for what uh, his people did. It, it's a subterfuge and that's part of Islam also to deceive the unbeliever. So uh, that's my background that I have an interest and in. I'll I've been keeping track of Islamic terror. I, when I went to, to America and, and told people what was uh, how bad Islam was, I was mocked as a fool. And uh, then uh, there was the 9-11 that woke a few people up and I was still degraded by uh, a sister-in-law. Uh, what are you, Muslim or something talking about those things? And uh, uh, but I've kept on now since 2007 keeping track of Islamic terrorism and I'll put the links. Now it's come down to where there's about five a day. And I'll, I'll give you links to these uh, uh, bombings that I, I mentioned here in the YouTube video. Thank you. Putin's personal pride project, the Sochi Winter Olympic Games, has seen traditionally costumed Cossack militia brought out to patrol amid tightened security. The last thing he wants is any sort of disturbance. Public gatherings not connected with the Olympics will be banned. Let me just add, the terrorism and the openness of it is not an accident. It is to bring fear. The, wherever Muslims get enough of a group together to instill fear you either submit or you're dead and they want you to know that here they're killing the peaceful imams unbelievable we haven't caused any scandal. It was all set up. They shout and scream, telling us to leave. Do you think that would change anything? It wouldn't change. It would only be worse. The Russian Orthodox Church is still the largest religious body in the country, although many Russians don't follow any religion. Estimates vary, but some say 20% of Russians are Muslims. Rights defense groups are keeping a close watch on the rising rate of hate crime. Week. The migrant workers walk around with knives, threaten people, commit rape close to the police station. They attack and mug people, but nobody shows this. All these facts are kept hidden in police reports, and we look like fools. I'm reminded at the end of this video, I have a personal uh, experience having to do with race. I have two black grandsons. I paid 5000 of the $10,000 adoption fee. They were adopted from Haiti, from an orphanage there. And I had to have them as my grandchildren. But, uh, the older one uh, went into the American Army as a, uh, was trained as a helicopter repairman and spent time in Iraq and then spent time in Germany where he met and married a white German girl. Oh, these things aren't abstract news to me. Thank you. I'm going to have two articles uh, shown and read to you attached at the end here. The first is the uh, first five verses of Surah number nine, which shows the demand that the Muslims take control. That's the Quran, Surah 9, verses 1 to 5. The second is an article I just came across in the Washington Times. It's by Daniel Pipes, and it's quite insightful into the demographics and future of uh, Muslim Russia. Thank you. Surah 9, The Immunity.
This is one of the later surahs, after the surah of abrogation, where Allah can change his mind and come with something better. So this surah abrogates all those nice surahs that came before. Verses 1 through 5. This is a declaration of immunity by Allah and his apostle towards those of the idolaters with whom you have made an agreement. So go about in the land for four months and know that you cannot weaken Allah and that Allah will bring disgrace to the unbelievers. And announce from Allah and his apostle to the people on the day of the greater pilgrimage that Allah and his apostle are free from liability to the idolaters. Therefore, if you repent, it will be better for you. And if you turn back, then know that you will not weaken Allah and announce painful punishment to those who disbelieve, except those of the idolaters with whom you have made an agreement. Then they have not failed you in anything and have not backed up anyone against you. So fulfill their agreement to the end of their term. Surely God loves those who are careful of their duty. So when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent, and keep up prayer, and pay the poor rate, and extortion, leave their way free to them. Surely Allah is forgiving and merciful. Note the three successive forbidden months mentioned by Muhammad, months in which battles are forbidden, are the 11th, 12th, and the 1st. The single forbidden month is the 7th. These months were considered forbidden both within the new Islamic calendar and within the old pagan Meccan calendar. The stabbing death on October 10th of an ethnic Russian, Yegor Shcherbakov, 25, apparently by a Muslim from Azerbaijan, led to anti-migrant disturbances in Moscow, vandalism and assaults, and the arrest of 1,200, and brought a major tension in Russian life to the fore. Not only do ethnic Muslims account for 21 million to 23 million of Russia's total population of 144 million, or 15%, but their proportion is fast growing. Alcohol is a plague ethnic Russians are said to have European birth rates and African death rates. Their women have on average 1.4 children, and their men have a life expectancy of 60 years. In Moscow, ethnic Christian women have 1.1 child. In contrast, Muslim women bear 2.3 children on average and have fewer abortions than their Russian counterparts. In Moscow, Tatar women have 6 children and Chechen and English women have 10. In addition, some 3 million to 4 million Muslims have moved to Russia from ex-republics of the Soviet Union, mainly from Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, and some ethnic Russians are converting to Islam. These trends point to Christians declining in numbers by 0.6% a year and Muslims increasing by that same amount, which will have dramatic effects over time. Some analysts foresee Muslims becoming a majority in the 21st century and a demographic revolution that would fundamentally change the country's character. Paul Godel, an expert on Russian minorities, concludes that Russia is going through a religious transformation that will be of even greater consequence for the international community than the collapse of the Soviet Union. A Russian commentator he quotes envisions a mosque on Red Square in Moscow. The facile assumption that Moscow is and will remain Western-oriented is no longer valid, he argues. In particular, he predicts that the Muslim demographic surge will have a profound impact on Russian foreign policy. Within a few years, Muslims will make up half the conscripts in the Russian army. Joseph A. D'Agostino of the Population Research Institute asks, will such a military operate effectively given the fury that many domestic Muslims feel toward the Russian military's tactics in the Muslim region of Chechnya? What, if other Muslim regions of Russia M-some of which contain huge oil reserves M-rebel against Moscow? 
Will Muslim soldiers fight and kill to keep them part of the Russian motherland? Russia's increasingly confident Muslims, who constitute a majority of 57 out of the country's 182 ethnic groups, have started to use the term Muslim Russia to signal their ambitions. According to Muslim analyst David Isle Isaiah, this term affirms that Islam is an inalienable part of Russia and that Russia, as a state and civilization, could not exist without Islam and the Muslims. He notes that Muslims preceded ethnic Russians in much of the territory that is now Russia. His sweeping claims for Muslims include the exaggerations that they made critical contributions to Russia's culture and its military victories. Such talk causes ethnic Russians to shudder about the country's population loss of at least 700,000 people a year as they return to their faith and turn against Muslims. The results include biased media portrayals, attacks on mosques and other crimes, efforts to block Muslim immigration, and the rise of extreme Russian nationalist groups, such as Alexander Belov's movement against illegal immigration. The Kremlin has responded to the issue in contradictory ways. Then President Dmitry Medvedev in 2009 tried appeasement by stressing the importance of Islam to Russia, noting that Muslim foundations are making an important contribution to promoting peace in society, providing spiritual and moral education for many people, as well as fighting extremism and xenophobia. He also announced that, owing to its large Muslim population, Russia does not need to seek friendship with the Muslim world. Our country is an organic part of this world. However, as Island Berman of the American Foreign Policy Council points out, the Kremlin has discriminated against its Muslim minority and ignored, even abetted, the rise of corrosive xenophobia among its citizens. This has bred resentment and alienation among Russia's Muslims and dash sentiments that radical Islamic groups have been all too eager to exploit. Added to existing Islamic supremacist attitudes, this results in an increasingly restive Muslim minority. Discussions of Islam in Europe tend to focus on places like Britain and Sweden, but Russia, the country with the largest Muslim community in both relative and absolute terms, is above all the place to watch. The anti-migrant violence last week will surely be followed by much worse problems. Daniel Pipes is president of the Middle East Forum. Read more http slash slash world wide web point Washington Times point com slash news 2013 point slash 20 pipes Muslim Russia slash number x 2 i x in 9 x 2 sm follow us at w a s h t i n v s on Twitter.